My message today <clears throat> is I came about it from uh, Wednesday Bi well, Bible study at work. And we have it every day, so it's, uh, uh, I guess you can say, a con condensed version of our Wednesday Bible study. It's a passage of scripture that everyone seems to identify with or relate to. At least that's what, what I get from everyone. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 15, starting with verse 11 through 24. And if it pops up on the screen, you can do me a favor and help me read together. Because sometimes I, I kind of enjoy the congregational reading. Vice, someone standing up here gets kind of everyone involved in the reading. So if it's up on the screen... Uh, just join in with me, and I'll be coming from New King James. <clears throat> and this is Luke 15, starting with verse Luke 15, starting with verse 11. Then he said, "A certain man had two sons, <clears throat> and the younger of them said to his father, "Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me." So he divided to them his livelihood, and not many days after the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country. And there wasted his possession with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him in the fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this son was dead and is alive again, and he was lost in his farm, and let, they began to be merry. And what I found out with this passage of scripture, whenever he, there's a Bible study going on. At the end of that Bible study, most people, are, most would either mouth to themselves or they'll have that expression and they'll say, that's me. So the title of my message is, that's me. Because so many people relate and identify with this, either as a, a parent, as the father, or typically it's the younger son, is what most people identify with. So we'll, <clears throat> so now I'll go back and we'll look at it and Verse 11, and I'll read verse 11 through 13 one more time. And he says, then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to him, his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. So he divided to them his livelihood, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country and wasted his possessions with prodigal living. So in that Bible study, the first question I asked everyone was how do you define a far country? Because it's important that everyone's on the same page when we discuss topics. So I asked them, how do you define a far country? And what we came up with, or what I share with them, a far country is any place that God isn't. Any place that God isn't is considered a far country. Because we can understand in, the, in that passage, he had left his father and went on a journey. But now today we can look at that far country as many things. I was in the United States military, the Navy, and I can tell you the Navy is a far country, right? <laughs> it's hard to find God in the Navy in some spots, right? You might have your beacon of light, but the United States Navy or the military is a far country. And then some of us work in a shipyard. And at times the shipyard is a far country, right? School teachers, hey, nowadays the school is a far country, right? And some of us even feel that the United States government or the United States of America is turning into a far country, right? So when we look at it, we have to look at it for what God's word says and 
It looks like a far country. And then we talked about the age of the younger brother. And it's interesting that when they give it the age of the younger brother, normally they say 19 to 25 years old, age of the younger brother. Anyone think any other age? 19 to 25, pretty much a young guy. But we find out today that there's a lot of people in the same condition as this younger son. All right? Outside of the range of 18 to 25 when we think about it. There's a lot of old guys that's prodigal living out in society today, right? Living apart from God, out in a far country, prodigal living. Now, the thing that's interesting that I found interesting and I shared with the group was that the younger sad son asked for his portion, but the father gave to both, right? He divided it up and he gave it to both. So the question I have for myself is, what am I doing with the things God has blessed me with? Right? Am I being a good steward with those things? Because a lot of times that's what we want. We want it in others. We want it in our children. We want them to be good stewards of the things that we blessed them with as parents. But now what are we doing with the things that God has blessed us with? Are we being good stewards with what God has blessed us with? And those were the first questions that I asked the Bible study group. How do you define a far country? Right? And we pretty much came to the consensus of any place that God isn't. Now, the, the big issue with the son wasn't the fact that he was in a far country. It was the prodigal living that was the issue. Right? Because if we work in places of apart from God in that situation, but now how do we handle ourselves in those same places? And that took us to verse 14. And verse 14 reads, but when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. So I asked the group, how do you define a famine, and how is famine defined today? And typically we would define it as a lack of food. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm hungry. When we think of famines, no food. But a more interesting question would be, what about spiritual famines? Right? What about the spiritual famines that we see? I was talking to a friend of mine at work, and he was telling me about his wife. And he was like, my wife doesn't believe the Bible like you believe the Bible. So I asked him a question. I said, well, does she take her Bible to, to church with her? And he, he said, yes, she does. I said, when she gets home, she set it down on the table. And he said, yes, she does. And then the next question was, she picks it up next Sunday, and she takes it to church with her. And he said, Wow, how do you know? His wife was in a spiritual famine. If you don't spend time in God's word, yes, you're in a spiritual famine. Amen. So typically we have to look at famines as more than just food, right? We have to feed our spirits. And I know if I talk to you guys and I say, I'm going to go on a diet and I'm only going to eat once a week. <laughs> All right, I'm going to eat once a week. You look at me and go, what's wrong with you? Absolutely. You see me next week and be like, man, you look pretty bad. I know my, my diet is working, <laughs> right? I'm on my diet and it's working. I eat once a week, right? So I say that to say we have to spend time with God, right? So we avoid spiritual famine. Now we see in verse 14 still, we see that his needs have changed, right? We see that his needs have changed in verse 14, now he's in want, he's out of money. And who should he have turned to when his needs had changed? Who should he have turned to? Well, we would say God, but in, in the story, he should have went back to his father. And in life, it seems like one bad decision always leads to another. Right? I know parents look at us as kids, and I know my mother probably said, that boy just made another bad decision. Right? One bad decision leads to another. So we'll see who he actually turned to in verse 15. It says, then he, <clears throat> And then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. And no one gave him anything. So instead of turning back to his father, as you said, turning to God, he turned to someone that couldn't help him at all. He 
He sent him into the fields and told him to go feed swine. No help whatsoever. So the question I asked the Bible study group was this one. How often do we turn to others and not God first? Right? How long or how often do we turn to others and not God first? Because if he would have turned to God first, he probably would have told him to go in a different direction. So we kind of broke it down and said, well, turning to God would be turning to your Bible, reading your Bible, finding out what decisions you need to make. Prayer and have others pray for you or pray for you. And that's one thing our church does after every service is we have prayer requests. And normally people are sharing their desires and their needs. And then there's a collective praying for that individual over the week and sometimes over the two weeks and sometimes over a month. But he should have turned to God or his father first if we look at the story. Then the next question I have for him, how often do we try to meet the needs of others and not turn to God first? How often do we try to meet the needs of others when they have a problem instead of turning to God first and finding out what does God want me to do for that individual? And if we think back to Joseph, when his brothers wanted to, to kill him, well, Reuben stepped in and Reuben said, well, don't kill him. But what was Reuben's decision in the matter? If it was up to Reuben, Reuben would have taken Joseph back home. What would happen to the nation of Israel? Reuben would have had his desire, what he thought was best for Joseph. But God had another plan for him. So that's why we need to pray when someone comes and asks us for, hey, we need to pray to make sure we're making the right decision. Right. So often we just think that we need to help that individual. And then the next thing, next thing you know, we're helping them again. And we're helping them again. And we're thinking, how many times is this guy going to come to me? Right? So we need to spend time in prayer so we won't be like Reuben and take someone down the wrong path. And then they're looking at us like, you messed me up. How many times do you see that? Right? That's what they do on TV program. You see it all the time. You messed me up. I, didn't, I thought I was helping you. You gave me bad help. To prevent that, go to prayer. Now, it takes wisdom because you don't want to tell them, hey, I prayed for you and God told me don't help you. <laughs> uh, right? <laughs> so, so you're going to have to incorporate a little wisdom in that because you definitely don't want to, you know, so to solve that one. All right? So let's look at verse 17. And verse 17 reads, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? So he's in a bad spot and he knows he's in a bad spot. But the beauty of it, it says he came to himself. So one question I asked the group was, why does it take someone so long to come to themselves? Why does it take us so long to come to ourselves? We have God, we could pray, but sometimes it just takes us so long. And a couple of the answers they came up was, well, one is pride. Right? Pride says, I'm not going to ask anyone for help. I'm not even going to ask God for help on this one. I, I, I got myself into it. I can get myself out of it. And really what that turns into is self-reliance. Right? We're relying on ourselves instead of turning to God and getting that help that we need. So don't be prideful. Don't be self-reliant. As Charles Stanley would say, get on your knees and pray. Right? When we find ourselves in these situations. <clears throat> then verse 18 and 19. And what I like about verse 18 and 19, because his confession wasn't like our old confessions that we used to make. Our old ones was, God, if you get me out of this, dot, 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 dot. <laughs> Whatever dot, dot, dot was, right? But that's what we will cry out. God, if you get me out of this, if you get me out of this, two weeks later, God, if you get me out of this, I got you out the last time. <laughs> right? But we cry out constantly, God, if you get me out. So verse 18 and 19, he says, I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Now, sometimes we don't do that and cry out because we feel unworthy. Right? I messed up again. 
And he's like, yeah, I know. But I messed up again. Yeah, I know. And then we, what, what do we do on that one? We stop going to church. Right? We stop because we don't want a fellowship because we know we messed up. And then if it gets around the church, it's like, ah, oh, I messed up again. Yeah, we know you messed up. Come on back. But we feel so unworthy. Stop reading our Bibles. Stop fellowshipping. You know, there's people at my job that they'll stop fellowshipping with me. And it's like, hey, man, I don't even know what you did. Right? But that's what we need to do. We need to get out of that. We are worthy as children of God. Just like any parent, you want your children to come back home? That's what he wants you to come back home. <laughs> right? But then what he did is he actually put his confession, he put an action behind it. It wasn't just a confession. He put action behind it. And we look at verse 20. And it says, And he arose and came to his father. And when he still was a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and, rel <clears throat> and fell on his neck and kissed him. Now the beauty of that, at least the beauty of it to me, is he didn't make it home. That his father saw him. Now we could say he was probably an old man. And it says he ran to his son. And had compassion on him. Well, that's what God wants with us. He has compassion. He just wants us to come. Right? Change that direction. And return to him. And that's what he wants us to do. Right? And that's what I love about it. That dad got up. Now, my father was an old man when I was born. So if he would have got up and ran after me, I would have been surprised. <laughs> I'm just being honest. He was born in 1902, and I was born in 1961. So by the time I got to running age, or he could actually run after me, he was an old man. I would have been, hey, that old man chased me down. <laughs> I got to get back in the gym. <laughs> right. So once again, is it, and now when we reflect back, and we think of our own lives, isn't it amazing when we look back how God came after us? All right. We were out doing our thing. Chances are we weren't even thinking about God. We weren't thinking about church. We weren't thinking about fellowship. As a matter of fact, we're probably telling him, hey, man, get away with me with that stuff. But he chased us down. Aren't we glad he chased us down? All right. So that takes us to verse 21 and 23. And it reads... And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. The question I had for the group was, what was the father's response to his son? What was his response to his son? Well, he didn't say anything to his son. He turned to the servants. Right? But the father said to his servants. He didn't say a word to his son. Now, do you see the difference between how we would respond today? Right? We'd have to tell him, you messed up. Sit him down. You messed up, son. But we can see the difference. Some tell me when I was in charge in the Navy that I would give them the look. I didn't say very much, but they said I had the look. And I was to let them know that they messed up. And sometimes they didn't mess up because they said, I didn't want to see the look. Right? <laughs> and sometimes we just won't forgive them. Right? We won't forgive them. But as we see, father didn't say anything to his son. He said, servants. Someone... Nowadays, we might not call them servants, but take them to the restaurant. And then that way you can call for the servants, right? So, and then in verse 24, the father said this. He said, for my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and found and is found. And they began to be merry. So when the son was in a far country, guess what? He, he had a relationship. It was still father and son. He could still cry out to dad. But when he was in a far country, he had no fellowship. And that's what put him in a far country. There was no fellowship, 
relationship was still there. My relationship with my parents is, is still there, mother and father, but I have no fellowship. Now, the beauty of it is, and don't, don't take this the wrong way, but they still talk to me. I can't talk back, but I hear my mother's voice all the time, and I hear my father's voice if I'm messing up. And sometimes my dad is like, boy, <laughs> right? And I hear that, because if he's looking at me right now, he's like, boy, shave that stuff off your face. Because <laughs> that's what he said the last time he saw me with a beard. So they still, it's still there. So the beauty of it is we need to talk to our kids. Amen. Right? Because what they say is still here. That's right. When they talk. That's right. right? I was with my mother and she was in rehab. And we're walking the floor. And I do feel like I'm getting older. So I know what my grandfather would say right now. He said, just keep living. Amen. So I said that to my mother. And I said, well, you know what grandpa would say? He said, just keep living. And next thing I know, my mother's crying. I'm like, mom, why are you crying? I miss him, right? So I told my oldest brother, I was like, I made my mother cry. But it was a good, I guess, a good cry. But we need to talk to those that we, we love, right? Because it's, it's going to be there. And then when that remembrance comes, I hear him talking to me, oh, I'm doing stuff, and next thing I know, boy, what you doing? And I'm like, okay, Dad, I hear you. So, <clears throat> so with that, I came up with a question for the group, and it, you could take it two ways, and it was, how do we prevent going to a far country, or how do we prevent prodigal living? Either way you want to put it, I know on the board it's going to say, how do we prevent going to a far country, but really we can't prevent that because if it's the jobs that we work on, United States military, United States of America, if it's turning into a far country, then we can't avoid that. Right? But the thing that we can't avoid is the prodigal living. So our first, my first verse I have is Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Romans 12, 2. And it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So with that verse... I kind of determined that the younger son, he was already in a far country before his dad even gave him any money because that's where his mind was. Right? And so often, that's the things that are here are the things that we do. I used to tell people, hey, just watch somebody. If you want to know what they're thinking, just watch them. They're going to do it. Right? And then sometimes it just becomes a habit. And then that's when it's bad, especially when it's a bad habit. <clears throat> so that's the first verse in preventing us from going to a far country or prodigal living. The next is 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16. And it reads, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells up within you? And even Paul put that in the form of a question because evidently the people in Corinth didn't know that they were a temple. <clears throat> but then I hit them with this question. Well, first it was, we have the Holy Spirit living within us. But how much access do we give him? All right? Or do we treat him like that when we used to go visit a friend and you could only go in two rooms in the house? <laughs> and you had to use, ask for permission to use one of the rooms. Do we do that with the Holy Spirit or do we give him complete access? All right? Do we allow him here and here? The next scripture was Philippians 4.18 or 4.8. Philippians 4.8. And it reads, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things of a good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So if you go back to Romans 12 too, the renewing of our mind changes what we think about. When we renew our minds, we change what we think about. Those old things that we think about, we don't do it anymore. All right? Now, it's not saying that they won't try to enter in, but then what do you do with them? How do you process it? Because once it's here, it's always here. And I always try to share with people with young kids, you might want to limit what they put up here because it's up here forever. 
Right. Right. It's worse than a computer. At least with a computer, you got to push a button for it to come up. But when it's here, it just it's like, where in the world did that come from? And then you hear that voice. You remember when? Yeah, I guess I do remember looking at that. I guess I shouldn't have looked at it. Right? So renewing of our minds means we change what we think about. Amen. Next verse is going to be 1, Corinthians, or 1 Thessalonians 5.19. 1 Thessalonians 5.19. And it's a very short verse. And it says, do not quench the spirit. Do not quench the spirit. So the question is, are we listening? Because a lot of times, it's not a loud voice. Don't do it. What? I said, don't do it. The other voice is like, hey, man, do it. You remember when? <laughs> right? The only reason we did it because we enjoyed it. So, hey, you remember when? Holy Spirit is like, don't do it. So are we listening as the Holy Spirit is directing us? Right. And when we don't listen, sometimes this is a swift kick or a punch. Smack in the back of the head. And then you're like, wow, I shouldn't have done that. And then you grieved. I, I, Holy Spirit told me to do something once and I lived in Virginia Beach and I was in Norfolk when he told me to do it. And I know he told me to do it. I knew who was telling me to do it. I drive all the way to Virginia Beach. And you know, I, at that time, you passed a certain exit, there's no turning back. <laughs> right? There isn't. I made it all the way home, pulled up in the driveway, put it in reverse, and went all the way back to Norfolk. Because I couldn't beat me up too bad. Right? So I didn't like being beat up, so now I try to be a whole lot more obedient to it. <laughs> hey, I guess I'm not going to do that one. All right. Next verse is going to be 2 Timothy 2.15. 2 Timothy 2.15. And it reads, Be dil diligent to present yourselves approved of God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And King James would say, Study to show thyself approved of God. And then what I found, because of some of my co-workers, that doesn't mean looking for scriptures to justify what you want to do. <laughs> right? Yeah, people do it. Right? A friend of mine, he was like, well, King David did it, so I did it. Well, he didn't tell us David did it, so we emulate David. Right? You should have looked at it as a warning not to do what David did. Right? But he found a scripture to justify what he wanted to do and what he does, and that's what he ran with. So when he tells us to study, he's not saying study to find, uh, well, this is my way out, because it says right here I can do it. Right? Because oftentimes you misreading that. Right? Because he's not telling you to do those things. He's saying, don't do them. Look at the consequences of doing them. We have a historical record of those consequences. And then almost finishing up, the next passage or verse is Hebrews 10.25. Hebrews 10.25. And it reads, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some, but exhorting one another as so much more as we see the day approaching. And a lot of us, we see that day approaching whatever you want to make that day, but we know it's approaching. And we need fellowship with other believers because that fellowship strengthens. And I always like, if we're talking about Roman soldiers and the shield of faith and we put our shield, well, George puts his shield right here and I come alongside with my shield in front of him. Then Jack comes with his shield. Then Ken comes along with his shield. Next thing you know, we're, we're protected. We have a shield around us of faith. Amen. George's faith strengthens me. Ken's faith strengthens me. In turn, my, hopefully mine is strengthening them. Right? So we need fellowship with fellow believers. And that will keep us from that prodigal living. And my last verse in finishing up is going to be Hebrews 13.5. Hebrews 13.5. That's pretty good. I need my glasses today. <laughs> it says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, 
For he himself said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And most people wind up in prodigal living and in a far country because they're not content. Right? They see what's going on on the other side and they're not content. But one key that we have to remember is the end of that verse. Because God makes us a promise and he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So guess what? No matter where you go, guess who's there? Now when we were little kids, we would gladly hold our hand out for mom and dad to hold our hand. Then you get a little older and you want to tug away and then they're fighting with you. And then finally they just kind of give up and say, you know what? As long as you're in eyesight, you're all right. Well, guess what? We're always in eyesight. Oh, God. So those verses I looked at would prevent us from prodigal living. Can't prevent us from going to a far country because some of us work, live, and spend time in a far country. But hopefully those passages of scripture will help you out when you get to those point in time. So let us pray. Thank you, Grace Heavenly Father, for this time in your word. Thank you for always being present with us. Thank you for the indwelling of your spirit as we go. Thank you for the constant help that you provide us. And when we feel those times where we want to go to a far country or prodigal living, or we know someone that's in a far country or prodigal living, we have the tools to help and to point out and point them back to you. Thank you for all that you do, and thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. In the blessed name of Jesus, amen. Hallelujah. Let you know that my worship